I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Welcome to this week's episode. This week we're looking into not one, but two missing 411 cases. I know you like those the best if the download numbers are completely accurate. The two that we're going to cover take place in New Mexico, in the Santa Fe National Forest, specifically the Pecos Wilderness Area. The Santa Fe National Forest is in northern New Mexico, and New Mexico, if you aren't sure, is located in the southwest United States. The forest was established in 1915, and it covers 1,558,452 acres. The elevation ranges from 5,300 feet to 13,103 feet at the summit of Trucas Peak in the Pecos Wilderness. Within the Santa Fe National Forest borders, you'll find meadows, miles of conifers, and a dormant volcano with a 15-mile-wide crater. It has four wilderness areas, two wild and scenic rivers, and miles of scenic and historic byways. The terrain is dense and rugged, so it's the perfect place to go elk hunting. I mean, I guess so, since that's what our missing person was out doing when he disappeared. 61-year-old Melvin Isidore Nadell, or Mel, was a scrappy 5 foot 2 inch tall Caucasian around 130 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. Mel, though in his 60s, was extremely fit. He had a first degree black belt in Taekwondo and was a Pilates instructor. In fact, he owned a local Pilates studio called Pilates Fitness Plus. Mel was originally a Brooklyn, New York native who in 1991 moved to New Mexico with his wife and daughter to open a jewelry store with a longtime friend. Mel, his wife and daughter, lived together in El Dorado, New Mexico. While he owned and worked in the jewelry store, Mel homeschooled his daughter until she was 16, and then she took her GED and entered community college. Because of this, Mel and his daughter were extremely close. Mel eventually became a personal fitness trainer, and that's when he opened his Pilates studio. On Sunday, September 6, 2009, Mel tells his wife he's going to head back out to hunt elk with his friend Jim Muniz and Jim's brother-in-law in an area of the Santa Fe National Forest, close to Elk Mountain. He goes and changes into his typical hunting attire, warm polypropylene underclothes, thermal socks, hiking boots, camo pants, and camo shirt. Some descriptions include a turtleneck. He also packed his camping gear as he planned to camp overnight and come home the following day. He asked his wife if she was good feeding their pet bird, and off he went. He arrived at the camp and met up with Jim and his brother-in-law. Mel had been hunting with Jim Muniz for six years. Around 4.30 p.m., Mel tells his companions that he's going to walk about 50 yards or so away, set up a ground blind, and wait for a bit, then head back to camp and wait for them to get back. A ground blind is basically on the ground, and it's uh, something that you erect, put together to hide yourself from the game so to hide yourself from the elk and it's on the ground as opposed to like a tree stand or a tree blind that would hide you up in the tree for those who don't hunt or have no clue what I'm talking about there are two important things to know about Mel and hunting the first is that he loved the outdoors but he never roamed far from camp when hunting he preferred to set up ground blinds and wait he also always carried his GPS unit with him Mel had been lost before during a hunting trip several years in the past, and the experience kept him close to camp 
and always with his GPS. When Jim and his brother-in-law showed up back at camp around 7 p.m., Mel wasn't there. His Jeep was there, but there was no sign of Mel. Mel's hunting buddies used their flashlights to look around for him. They honked their car horn and fired shots in the air, but heard nothing in return. A nearby hunter with a satellite phone helped them call Jim's wife, who called police and informed Mel's wife. The three men then continued looking into the night. On Monday morning, searchers arrived on scene, and the dog teams arrived by the afternoon. Mel's Jeep was still there at camp, and it was locked. Upon searching it, they found his cell phone, GPS, and other gear. The only items missing were his gun and bow and arrows. There were three agencies involved in the search for Mel Nadell, the New Mexico State Police, the National Guard, who provided a helicopter, and the State Department of Corrections, who brought with them dog teams. There were about 30 searchers, several canine teams, and the helicopter. Because of the ruggedness of the terrain, only people experienced in search and rescue were able to join in the official search. The scent dogs were able to track Mel about 150 yards down a trail before the scent ended. It was the direction he had told Munoz he was going to travel. Because the scent ended, Jim felt that Mel had made it back to camp. He also said that the GPS being locked in the car was a little troublesome because, like I mentioned, Mel always carried it with him while hunting. It was one more possible sign that he had made it back to camp. But where the heck was he? Lieutenant Eric Garcia with the New Mexico State Police said, what is really concerning us the most is that Nadell's trail just flat out ends. It's a very strange type of predicament. The search was expanded by 10 miles in all directions from where the scent dogs lost his trail. The dogs kept tracking the same scent trail that ended where Mel's Jeep was parked, which was about a hundred or so yards from the camping area. The state police brought in crime scene investigators to rule out foul play. There was no indication of foul play or suspicious activity, but they wanted to be certain. On Wednesday, the search was stopped because of heavy rains and resumed again Thursday morning. Jim Munoz said that there was no sign of struggle and no cougar or bear tracks. He stated, even if he had been attacked by a cougar, we would have found his bow. Because really, how many bow or gun-toting cougars and bears have you seen? As the search continued to turn up nothing, there was some speculation that Mel Nadell had disappeared on purpose. Some of this was based on the police finding a new pair of women's jeans in his Jeep. The assumption was that he had a girlfriend on the side and had taken off with her. But Mel's wife said Mel was from the 80s rock era. He liked his jeans tight, and because he was only five foot two inches tall, he really didn't care if they were men or women's, as long as they looked good. Everyone who knew Mel discounted the idea he would disappear on purpose. Then there was some concern over a large-sized men's jacket the police claimed was found in Mel's Jeep. They were trying to find the owner, but Jim said the jacket wasn't in the Jeep in the initial search, and he was certain that it belonged to one of the searchers. Mel was also extremely close to his daughter, and he would never take off and not communicate with her. Jim said that when Mel arrived at camp, he was in a good mood, smiling and joking around. Jim also said that Mel had not been drinking. Mel's wife said he was fit and in good health. And though Mel's parents died from heart disease, Mel had absolutely no symptoms of having any heart issues. And if on the chance he did have a heart attack, he most certainly would have been found nearby. Also interesting to note is that Mel had a recent knee injury and actually went hunting with it wrapped up. So that also suggests that he wouldn't have wandered very far between the injury and his aversion to getting lost. It seems unlikely Mel would have just wandered off into the woods. Jim Munoz said of Mel, he enjoyed going with us, he enjoyed buying the gear, 
but he wasn't the kind to go out hiking and walking miles away. During the search, Mel's background was checked, and he had no criminal history and no civil case history. There was just nothing to offer any clues as to what happened to Mel. No obvious things in his life and history, and nothing found in the search. After six days, the official search was called off on September 12th. His hunting buddies and local guides continued unofficial searches for Mel. There was a psychic who offered information, and that lead was followed up using scent dogs. It led to the edge of actor Val Kilmer's ranch, but it offered no evidence of Mel or his whereabouts. On June 16th, nine months after he went missing, Taos Search and Rescue conducted another search for Mel, but it too turned up nothing. Nothing has ever been found of Mel. No remains, no clothing, no gun, and no bow and arrows. He simply vanished without a trace. Would you be surprised to learn that Mel isn't the only missing person from that area? You, you wouldn't be surprised because I already told you we were talking about two. So, obviously there's another one. Back in September 1998, 71-year-old Emma Tresp went missing in the Pecos wilderness on her way to a religious retreat. Emma Tresp, 71 years old, 5 foot 6 inches tall, and about 120 to 135 pounds. She had graying brown hair, green eyes, a mole on the right side of her nose, and she wore glasses. She was the daughter of a German immigrant, and she enjoyed adventure. After she was married, she and her husband and children went on many camping trips as a family. Emma even took her grandsons on a cross-country trip to Washington, D.C., where they camped along the way. Her family called her small but fierce. She also traveled visiting places like China, New Zealand, Egypt, and Israel and in 1998, she had already been to Ecuador and Machu Picchu in Peru. Emma was a resident of North Little Rock, Arkansas, and she was a deeply religious Catholic. On August 31, 1998, Emma left her daughter's house in Stillwater, Oklahoma, to head to a religious retreat at the Benedictine Monastery near Pecos, New Mexico. She purchased gas at 3 p.m. at a gas station in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, and that is the last time anyone saw Emma Tresp. Emma was familiar with the route she had been taking. She had attended this specific retreat two or three times before. On September 5th, Emma's daughter Lisa didn't get the customary birthday phone call from her mother. Emma made a point to call each of her nine children on their birthdays every year, so to not hear from her was rather unusual. Concerned, Lisa contacted her sister Rose, who was a nun, and Rose got in touch with the monastery and learned that Emma had not checked in to the retreat. Emma Tresp was reported missing on September 8th, and her children headed to New Mexico to look for her. They contacted hospitals to see if she had been admitted and somehow maybe didn't know who she was or wasn't able to communicate. They made flyers with her photo and information and put them throughout the area. Then, about a week after she was reported missing, a hunter saw one of the flyers and reported seeing a vehicle stuck on a rough dirt road. It was Emma's car. The white four-door Honda Civic was discovered locked and abandoned on Forestry Road 63A near the Glorieta, Pecos, New Mexico area about 10 to 15 miles from Route 63. The rear of the car was lodged against a dirt embankment and stuck on a large rock. Some reports said it was undamaged. Others mentioned that the oil pan was cracked as a result of getting stuck. The belief was that Emma hadn't intended to end up on the road she was on, but she drove nine miles before she stopped to try to back up and turn around and then got the car stuck. At the time, there would have been cabins, trailers, and houses at the beginning of the road, but where her car was found, there were no houses, and the road was so rutted and full of potholes, it was difficult to maneuver even on an ATV, 
according to Emma's family. There is no cell reception in that area, so police speculated that she grabbed her purse, locked the car, and headed on foot down the road back the way she had come. There were no tracks visible around the car, and there was nothing indicating an abduction. Dogs did not pick up her scent beyond the car. In the locked car was a blanket, metal thermos, books, an unopened six-pack of Sprite, a hat, a cookie, and two dollars in change. In the trunk of the car, police found her travel bag with her clothes inside, still neatly folded. The only item not in the car was Emma's purse. 200 searchers searched a 30-square-mile area for Emma Tresp. There were 12 to 13 dog teams, 20 teams on horseback, and a National Guard helicopter. No trace of Emma was found, and the search was called off after a few days. The family didn't give up, though. They hired a private investigator who went out searching on horseback. They used some unconventional methods to look for Emma, too, like consulting a map dowser to try to find her. A map dowser uses a pendulum and a map to try to find missing things like people or artifacts. The pendulum is held over the map, and the dowser asks whether the person or object is in the area. This eventually leads to a possible location. It's similar, in a way, to water dowsing, where someone uses a stick to find water underground. The family also paid four different psychics to try and find Emma, but they ended up with four different suggestions, and the psychics were absolutely no help. No trace of Emma Tresp has been found. There was some question about why she would leave behind her cell phone, but you need to remember, this was 1998. Cell phones were not as mainstream then as they are now. Cell service was spotty, and back then there were things like roaming charges and charges per minute of use. So if there was no service, the phone was not much use to her at all. Other information I found said the day Emma went missing was a typical summer day with temps in the 70s, and it was sunny. There was also a mention that the road her vehicle was found on is known to locals as Camino del Diablo, or the Devil's Road. No idea why, though. It could be as harmless as the rough road terrain generating the name. There was also a brief mention that there were prints, thought to be Emma Tresp's prints, around the vehicle, but none leading away. There was no blood found, and scent dogs only picked up her scent around the car. And I know... <laughs> that I told you I only had two missing persons cases to cover, but surprise! This time it is a surprise. I have more that I will touch on briefly. The year before Emma went missing, the truck of Robert Amos Browning, who was 19, was found near Monastery Lake, which you might guess is close to the Benedictine Monastery, on May 15, 1997. The truck was unlocked and the windows were down. In the truck was Robert's passport, ID, food, fishing gear, sleeping bag, clothes, a small amount of money, a childhood stuffed animal, his glasses, a pack of cigarettes, and his social security card. Robert's family said that he was basically homeless and living out of his truck. One item that was missing was the ignition key to the truck. A locksmith was able to make a copy and when they used it, the truck started right up without any issue, ruling out any mechanical problems. It also had half a tank of gas in it when it was found. The night before, Robert Browning had stayed with his brother in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Robert's father said that his son had met with a Navy recruiter earlier that day and was scheduled to take the placement test the next day, but never showed. Robert had told his brother he was going camping in the Pecos wilderness. A search consisting of a helicopter, dog teams, and state police on foot and on horseback was conducted May 18th. No sign of Robert was found. A second search was dismissed by state officials as being too expensive. Local search teams practicing 
agreed to keep an eye out for any sign of Robert when they were in the area. Robert was 19 when he disappeared and was 5 foot 11 inches tall and 140 pounds. He had a tattoo on his upper right arm of a triangle inside a circle. There was some mention that it's possible that Robert attempted to disappear or that Robert wanted to disappear and he left his truck the way he did on purpose. Part of me, though, wants to say, if you're making plans for your future, and that means that your life could be looking up a little bit more, then why would you just disappear? I don't know. Moving on, we have another missing person, and this one is Stranger. November 7th, 2017, Stanley Vigil went missing while hunting with his family. Stanley was 54 years old, 5 foot 10 inches tall, and 200 pounds. He was with his sister, father, and other family hunting and driving through the mountains when he spotted deer. Stanley exited the truck to get out and track the deer, which was not unusual for their hunting party. The group waited at the truck and within five minutes, snow and fog spread through the area, dropping the visibility to only about 10 yards. After 15 minutes, those waiting at the truck started calling Stanley's name, honking the horn, and firing shots in the air. They heard one shot fired back, but it was further away and nothing else was heard. He never returned to the truck. They called for police and search and rescue, but their searches turned up nothing. Independent searches were organized by the family and included the use of drones to search the harder to reach areas. Robert's sister said her brother knew the area well. She even stated in one news article that searchers had found a game camera that showed Stanley had made it down to the base of the mountain. She also said that he had stopped at a trailer to ask for help. State police did not respond to a request to confirm that information. Stanley Vigil enjoyed hunting and fishing and the outdoors in general and spent time coaching his son's various sport teams. He was a longtime employee of the New Mexico Department of Transportation. In April of 2018, the body of Stanley Vigil was found by an off-duty officer who was out fishing. Stanley's family was told that he had drowned and also that he had head trauma and broken ribs. The location where he was found was nine miles from where he disappeared. Even though he was found, there are still many questions about his disappearance. If he drowned, then he was breathing when he went into the water. How did he end up with head trauma and broken ribs? Stanley's father feels there's some kind of foul play involved, and I would agree if he did in fact make it down the mountain and ask for help. In my research, I discovered that this area of the Pecos Wilderness is starting to be known as the Pecos Triangle. It has this moniker not just for the strange and numerous missing persons cases, but also because of a large number of UFO sightings. It is also said that the Native Americans believed this region was inhabited by a wide range of evil spirits and supernatural creatures, like giant snakes and a shape-shifting demon. Early settlers talked of strange lights seen in the woods and on the mountain. There's mention of the ghost of a priest who was supposedly killed by Native Americans and his ghost now roams areas of the wilderness. People see a dark, shadowy figure moving through the woods, but when they go to see who it is, there's no one there. The area was also the site of the Battle of Glorietta Pass that is dubbed the Gettysburg of the West. It was a battle during the Civil War where the Confederates tried to break the Union's possession of the West, but ended up with the Confederates retreating into Arizona and Texas. Another point to mention, New Mexico is number three in UFO and Bigfoot sightings behind Washington and Oregon. I want to stress I am certainly not saying that any of these things were involved in the disappearances of these people. Not at all. I think possibly Robert Browning potentially could have disappeared on purpose. That's my thought. I think that 
Mel Nadell's disappearance is highly unusual. I think Emma Tresp, she's older. You can get confused easily. But it seems rather strange that she would go off of the road. It, it, the road might have been rough, but it was certainly a well-defined road. So hers is definitely strange. Where did she go? And Stanley Vigil, while he was found, there's a lot of questions surrounding that case. Did he in fact make it to the bottom of the mountain and ask for help? If he did, how the heck did he end up in the river with head trauma and broken ribs? Seems a little suspect. But I wouldn't be doing my job with this paranormal podcast if I didn't also tell you about the paranormal things that popped up prominently in my research. I do want to take a moment to tell you if you're out hunting or hiking or camping, please make sure that someone knows that knows your plans. Plans should include expected departure and arrival times, so if you don't return, they can get help. Also, they should include your exact location. Sometimes when people go missing, the search doesn't start right away because they're not exactly sure what trail the person took, what campground the person was camping in, or what area they were camping in. So you need to make sure that somebody knows your arrival and departure time and knows exactly where you plan to go. It's number one in Leave No Trace. If you're a hiker, a scout, hunter, you should know Leave No Trace. Number one, plan and prepare. I also do not suggest going alone. It's a little pet peeve of mine. Maybe it's from the buddy system in scouts. You always have a buddy with you. And if you're out in the woods and you do get lost, remember the acronym STOP. S stands for stop and stay where you are, which is a huge thing. Don't go wandering around. The further you wander, the longer and harder it is for search and rescue to find you. T is for think. Think about what items you have with you and where you might have taken that wrong turn. O is for observe. Do you see a road? Do you see trail markers? Do you hear people? And P is for plan. Make a plan for what to do if you need to stay longer than you want to. Do you have the ability to make fire, build a shelter, etc.? That's going to do it for this episode. Remember, you can find Lurk wherever you find your favorite podcasts or at lurkpodcast.com. On the website, you'll find all our episodes plus links to our social media accounts. If you like what you hear, tell a friend or take a minute to give us a five-star review. If you have any feedback or suggestions on topics, feel free to email me at lurkpodcast at yahoo.com or send a message through one of our socials. And a reminder, there is a raffle currently ongoing for a Bigfoot lap quilt valued at $225. Details are on our Facebook page. Tickets are two for $5 or five for $10. The information is there to do Venmo or PayPal. This is being done in conjunction with So Sci-Fi and Beyond, who I travel to the different festivals with. All the money raised goes to help my daughter, who suffered a serious ATV accident and ended up with a traumatic brain injury. She is recovering, still not working. So um, the money that we're raising goes to help pay for expenses. You know, the bills don't go away because you are in an ATV accident. Anyway, it's a really cool quilt. Liz, it's so sci-fi and beyond. Her mom pieced it together. Liz did the quilting. I really want it for myself. So anyway, check that out. And until next time, keep lurking. <laughs>